This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Friday Fellows Conference. Uh, happy Friday morning. Uh, our speaker this morning, as you can see, is Dr. Jeff Wang. Jeff is a third year fellow in the clinical investigator track, uh, did medical school at Louisiana State University, uh, then went to Johns Hopkins for his internal medicine residency. Uh, he then did a critical care fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, then came here and did uh, research with Dr. Morris et al. Uh, these past couple years, and he's going to talk to us today about ECMO. Uh, take it away, Dr. Wang. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for the introduction, and thank you to everybody logged in this morning. So, title of my presentation is going to be Unloading the Left Ventricle in Cardiogenic Shock, supported by VA ECMO, and we're going to go from pathophysiology to practice. No disclosure, so I'll start off with a brief patient case, and then I will discuss the relevant background on cardiogenic shock and the rising use of VA ECMO. And then before we get into the adverse hemodynamic effects of VA ECMO, I'm going to first review the pressure volume loop and just kind of show what normal is. And then after that, we will show how VA ECMO affects the, the pressure volume loop of the left ventricle. And then after that, we'll discuss about 20 minutes uh, LV unloading literature review. And then the last slide will be a case conclusion. So we have a 32-year-old woman who presented to an outside hospital with shortness of breath and new bilateral lower extremity edema. She was recently postpartum. She had delivered two months prior, and she was found to be an acute decompensated heart failure. Echo showed that her EF was decreased to 10%. She had no previous echo. And the, uh, the cardiologist at the outside hospital went to a right heart cath and found that all the pressures were elevated. The right atrial pressure was 19. RV was 51 over 12. The PA was 51 over 33 with a mean of 41. And the wedge was 28. Her index was very low at 1.26, and her lactate was elevated at 3.5. So at this point, the outside hospital correctly assessed that the patient was in cardiogenic shock and the etiology was felt to be peripartum cardiomyopathy. And at that point, they started the butamine and worked on transferring her to a referral center for VAD versus heart transplant. So upon arrival to the referral hospital, she developed worsening cardiogenic shock. She required low-dose epinephrine and nit nitroprusside for afterload reduction, and she was undergoing expedited heart transplant evaluation. On hospital day 12, her cardiogenic shock worsened, and she needed to get an intra-aortic balloon pump placement. So here you can see on the chest x-ray, there's the stripe uh, in the intra-aortic balloon pump, and it's right below the, the aortic knob, which means it's appropriately placed. About two weeks later, she was still waiting for heart transplant. She developed worsening cardiogenic shock, and she was cannulated for VA ECMO using a peripheral configuration. The drainage catheter was a left femoral vein, 23 French. The return was a left femoral arterial cannula, 15 French and she had a six French distal perfusion catheter in the superficial femoral artery. So here again, you can see the intraortic balloon pump appropriately placed, and then now the venous drainage cannula from, from ECMO is appropriately placed in the right atrium. About three days later, she started to develop pulmonary edema. She was tachypneic. She was on four liters to maintain saturation above 92%. And at this point, there was concern for increased LV EDP due to VA ECMO, and so at this point, a second venous cannula, a right femoral vein, 21 French, was placed into the left atrium via a transeptal puncture. Post-procedure, she was weaned to room air within a few hours, and she remained waitlisted for heart transplant. So here you can see the intraortic balloon pump, the right atrial drainage catheter, and now you can see the new placement of the left atrial drainage catheter via transeptal puncture. And so with that, I'll start my presentation. So Cardiogenic shock is a simple concept. It's basically pump failure to the point where the heart is unable to meet the, demand, the metabolic demands of the body. However, hemodynamically, it's been very difficult to define. There's been multiple iterations over the last 20 years. However, for reference, what I'm going to do is put up the definition put forth by Dr. Judy Hockman in the 1999 shock trial, which she defined it as hypotension with a systolic of less than 90 for 30 minutes, or you need inotropes to maintain that. You need to have impaired perfusion or end organ dysfunction as a result of the hypotension, meaning cool extremities, altered mental status, low urine output, or an elevated lactate. And then finally, the heart has to be the culprit, defined as an index of less than 2.2, and the wedge has to be greater than 15. And the wedge is put in there to rule out hypovolemia as a cause. 
for uh, the, the shock. So at the, uh, over the last few years, though, it's been more than just cardiogenic shock. There's really been more differentiation into, a, into acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, and heart failure, cardiogenic shock. And really, it's the pace of how you go into cardiogenic shock. In patients with AMI cardiogenic shock, you essentially go from ambulatory right here. You have a catastrophic event, of event and you end up in cardiogenic shock. Whereas with heart failure, there's really more relapses. Sometimes you improve with GDMT, and then it gets worse. And then after several years of hospitalization, uh, you do end up in cardiogenic shock if, uh, if the heart failure progresses. And as you can imagine, if you develop cardiogenic shock over a, a few years, that you're going to have more compensatory mechanisms. So despite all the research in cardiogenic shock over the last 20, 25 years or so, there's really only one guideline recommended therapy with mortality benefit, and that's primary PCI, and that's only an AMI cardiogenic shock. Otherwise, the other guideline recommended therapies for cardiogenic shock really have no demonstrated mortality benefit in randomized clinical trials. In fact, the things that are recommended, such as inotropes, can actually worsen cardiogenic, can actually worsen your mortality. Temporary MCS has a two-way recommendation, but it's non-randomized. A multi multidisciplinary heart team, a PA catheter, and then referral. And none of those are randomized, and uh, there's limited data to support those. And I think there is good reason for why the topic of this talk, VA ECMO, is not on here. And it's because of, uh, of recent data that further supports that as well. So VA ECMO and the recent ECLS shock randomized clinical trial showed that there was no benefit in patients with AMI cardiogenic shock cannulated for VA ECMO. And then also, as soon as that trial was published, a meta-analysis was performed that used ECLS shock in the three other randomized clinical trials. I will caveat, though, that you can see based on the forest plot that the ECLS shock contributed about 75% of the data to this meta-analysis. So despite the lack of recommendations for using VA ECMO, the use of VA ECMO in cardiogenic shock is increasing. And not only is it increasing, it's increasing at a very rapid rate. So I draw your attention to the circles, the black circles on the figure here, and basically using national inpatient sample, using ICD and CPT codes, the use of VA ECMO in the last 20 years has increased from 0.1% of all patients with cardiogenic shock to 3% in 2017. And the authors also report that in the same time frame, they, uh, the Impella use increased from 2.5 to 20% as well. And not only is it, uh, and then when we look at uh, AMICS specifically. So this is actually a paper published by one of uh, the former inter interventional fellows here, Saras, who used the NIS also to identify trends. And he found that in AMI cardiogenic shock, the use is increasing as well. So I guess, you know, at this point, I, uh, I want you to ask yourself, you know, if there's no guideline recommended therapies for VA ECMO, then why is it increasing at such a rapid rate? And I think there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, the first one that I'm going to uh, Posit as a reason why more, uh, why we are using so much VA ECMO is the high mortality in cardiogenic shock. So again, here's a paper that uses the national inpatient sample. And historically, cardiogenic shock, the mortality has been pegged around 50%. And you can see maybe in the early 2000s, it was probably close around 50%. But recently, the mortality has trended down to somewhere close to 35 40%. However, 35 40% is still a very high mortality. And I think at this point, a lot of clinicians are desperate to do anything to try to avert, uh, try to reduce that mortality, hence why VA ECMO is being used. And not only is it being found in the national inpatient sample, uh, registry data, which is a little bit higher quality, the Swiss, Swiss shock registry has also pegged uh, the mortality of cardiogenic shock around 35% in recent data as well. Um, there's also other reasons, including billing, that I think is driving VA ECMO. And then another reason that I think that VA ECMO rises uh, increasing is this right here. So this is a figure from Dr. Judy Hockman's 2003 review on cardiogenic shock. And essentially, you can see that everything leads from myocardial dysfunction. So the idea of cardiogenic shock being pump failure is really attractive. And so, you know, the question is, well, how do you fix pump failure? Well, the, you know, the, I think the intuitive answer is that you increase cardiac output, but it's, it's really not quite that simple. So Let's start talking about VA ECMO. So VA ECMO, there's really two flavors. There's peripheral and central. So in peripheral VA ECMO, the configuration is used mainly for resuscitation, or ECMO CPR, ECPR. And in this configuration, 
the drainage cannula goes into the femoral vein up to the right atrium, or at least to the IVC, and it drains blood. And then it goes into a, a centrifugal pump. And then after the centrifugal pump, it pushes it through an oxygenator and then it returns it to the femoral artery. And there's also a central configuration, which is really cardiopulmonary bypass. It drains from the right atrium, and then it, uh, it returns directly into the proximal aorta. For this presentation, I'm only going to discuss peripheral VA ECMO because central VA ECMO really is more in the cardiac surgical arena. So let's talk about the hemodynamic effects of VA ECMO first. So VA ECMO can generate flows up to five to six liters per minute. And one thing I want you to understand about VA ECMO is that the flow in VA ECMO goes retrograde. So it goes up the femoral artery towards the descending aorta and then against, it, uh, against into the ascending aorta and works against the left ventricle. And so how I conceptualize VA ECMO is that VA ECMO is really more of a flow presser. And so what do I mean by flow presser? So when you start VA ECMO, you first generate a lot of flow. So you get the benefit from the VA ECMO by increasing your cardiac output. However, that same cardiac output is going to incur your cost, meaning that as cardiac output increases, your mean arterial pressure, meaning your afterload on your heart, is going to increase as well. So before we discuss the adverse hemodynamic effects of VA ECMO, I think it's, it's pertinent to quickly review what a normal pressure volume loop looks like. So I typically start off in diastole, and the start of diastole is atrial valve, uh, aortic valve closure. And so after the aortic valve closes, the left ventricle re uh, goes under quick relaxation. You'll get isovolumic relaxation. And then once the left ventricle pressure is less than left atrial pressure, you'll have your mitral valve opening, ventricular filling with passive and atrial kick. And then at the beginning of systole, you'll have your mitral valve closed. You'll undergo isovolumic contraction, and then once the LV pressure exceeds aortic pressure, then you'll have ejection, left ventricular ejection. So this is what a normal pressure volume loop should look like. And one point that I do want you to pay attention on this uh, PV loop is the, the green circle down there, which is the pressure at end diastole in the left ventricle or your LV EDP. So let's first look at a uh, PV loop of what happens when you increase the afterload because VA ECMO, again, I conceptualize, conceptualize it as a flow presser, and so it's going to increase the afterload on the PV loop. So let's start off again in diastole. So because your aortic pressures are now higher, your end systolic pressure or when the AV closes, the aortic valve closes, is going to be higher. And then it's going to undergo isovolumic relaxation and drop down a little bit further to the right along the volume, the x-axis. And then it's going to go more to the right. Your uh, EDP is going to go more to the right as you fill up. So your EDP, your preload is now higher. And then now, because again, your aortic pressures are higher, your aortic valve is going to open at a higher left ventricular pressure. And then the ejection pressures will actually be higher as well. So in summary, once you increase the afterload on the left ventricle, uh, what's going to happen is the left ventricle is going to compensate by moving the PV loop more to the right. And I also want you to notice that the PV loop is a little narrower as well. So let's see what happens as you increase the flow further and further. And so this is from a good review on VA ECMO published in 2018. And so you can see that as you increase the flow from 1, 2, 3, 4 to 4.75, as the flow increases, your afterload is going to gradually increase. And so the pressure volume loop shifts to the right and your PV loop gets narrower, and what that represents is your stroke volume decreases, and also your pulse pressure decreases too. A pulse pressure, as you know, is a good surrogate for your stroke volume. And then finally, the EDP, the very bottom right point, keeps on going higher and higher and higher, and this is the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, so it can't, uh, it has to honor that, um, that line here, so it can't go beyond that, but you can see that it just keeps on riding the line all the way up to the point where at 4.75, you have a very, very narrow pulse pressure, your stroke volume is very low, and you're at much higher pressures against the left ventricle. So why do we care about this? What are the complications to the LV afterload? So first, you're gonna increase your LV EDP as you saw on the previous figure. And so there's really two main issues with increasing your LV EDP. The first is pulmonary edema. So the problem with pulmonary edema is of course, you can give oxygen to improve it, but you still have native cardiac output. And if your native cardiac output is low in oxygen, 
then what's going to happen is the most proximal part of your aorta, which is your right arm, and then your carotids are going to be perfused, and also your coronaries as well. And so if you perfuse your coronaries and your brain with, ba uh, with uh, uh, hypoxic blood, then you're going to get uh, myocardial and cerebral ischemia. And you can actually see something called Harlequin syndrome or North-South syndrome in patients who have really bad pulmonary edema. And then secondly, you know, the whole purpose of VA ECMO is usually to, un to take care of the heart. And if your, if your LVEDP is really high, then you're going to impair your coronary perfusion because your coronary perfusion pressure is defined by your diastolic minus your EDP. And then finally, I think another really important key complication to note is that if the afterload increases too much, your left ventricle cannot eject at all, and your aortic valve will start to non-open. It will not open, and that's going to lead to LV stasis. And LV stasis will lead to thrombi, which can either embolize, causing strokes or limb ischemia, or in the worst case scenario, the entire LV will clot off. And at that point, um, VA ECMO is essentially futile. So I'm not going to get too much into methods for unloading the LV because I think that's a little, that could be a whole talk in itself and it's a little out of the scope of this presentation. However, I will group it into four main categories. So Unloading the LV could be as simple as starting nitride and, and vasodilating, uh, reducing the afterload. And then, the, and then after that, it's all devices pretty much. Intraaortic balloon pump, as you know, during systole, it will deflate and that will decrease the afterload. Left, uh, left atrial transeptal puncture, which was the, patient, uh, the case presentation that I presented earlier. And then finally, uh, a, a popular approach here is impella, where you can put a percutaneous LVAD and then um, you will essentially drain the left uh, ventricle from that. So the, the, this figure here, H, is percutaneous LVAD, uh, the pressure volume loop. And you can see that it looks kind of funny. It looks like a triangle. And so what happens when you put an impella is that you lose the isovolumic phases of your, of your pressure volume loop. So you're continuously draining the left ventricle. So throughout the entire cardiac cycle, you're always moving to the left. And that's why th throughout the entire cardiac cycle, you can see that um, that the that, that that the point is moving uh, left, and there's no isovolumic phases. And over here, uh, with the figure on the for titled F here, that's this is what happens when you drain the left atrium or drain the preload. So at this point, uh, I want to go into the practice of LV unloading. And so I think, at least for me, these are the four questions that I've identified as important to consider at the bedside to. to to think about who we should be unloading. So here are the four questions. So the questions that I identified, which pop patient population should we consider for LV unloading? What are the key clinical and hemodynamic variables to consider for LV unloading? When should we consider LV unloading? Should it be proactive or reactive? And which device should we use to unload the left ventricle? Should it be percutaneous, uh, uh, like an impella, or should we be using a balloon pump? So, um, before I try to get into the data, which is going to be the rest of the talk, uh, you know, you always try to look to the guidelines to see if there's any guidelines. But as you can probably guess, there's really no guidelines on this as well. If there's no guidelines on VA ECMO and cardiogenic shock. However, uh, based on this uh, paper that I found, I think that there are some potentially expert opinion out there on when you should do this. And I would say that most clinicians would consider Un, uh, unloading the LV uh, when patient when uh, patients have a non-opening aortic valve when there's pulmonary edema or refractory VT. I think some clinicians would unload the LV if there are increased LV dimensions on the echo because that means that there's a lot of stasis and predispose you to developing LV thrombus. If you have a narrow pulse pressure, because again, if you see the narrow pulse pressure, you can imagine on that PV loop that it's all the way to the right, and you're about to have AV, not, uh, AV uh, aortic valve non-opening. And then I think probably these are uh, probably like a wedge pressure of 18 by itself or LVOT, VTI of less than 10 have been cited as some reasons when to unload, but I think less clinicians would use that solely as a reason to unload. So now let's start looking at the data. So the data is not that much, so I think that uh, it, it shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes. And so this is a 2019 uh, Jack uh, meta-analysis that looked at LV unloading. And what they did was they looked at all patients with cardiogenic shock card, uh, cannulae with VA ECMO, and they identified 40% of their patients had AMI cardiogenic shock, 25% had heart failure cardiogenic shock, the other was valvular or 
uh, kind of a, a bunch of mixed etiologies. And then the total size was about 4,000. About 1,700 got unloaded and 2,300 did not get unloaded. And I'll bring your attention to the forest plot right here. You can see they categorized it into three types of uh, uh, LD unloading. They categorized into first intra-aortic balloon pump, which accounted for about 92% uh, of their data, or eight, I guess 82% of their data. And then, and then you can see they also looked at impella by itself, and then they looked at left atrial drainage by itself. And across all three unloading techniques, there seems to be a mortality benefit to unloading. And then when they looked at the overall effect, it did favor unloading. But again, a lot of these studies, pretty much all of them were observational. And so uh, there's definitely going to be a publication bias to this. So now let's look at the registry data, which again is probably a little bit higher quality. And so this is a stop shock German registry, which uses Impella. And it's a retrospective observational um, registry in Europe. And it looks at 16 centers in four countries. And the data coordinate, coordinating center is located in, in Germany. And so here they, uh, they, they actually had two publications. The first publication is this one I want to go over first. They had 686 patients, 65% were acute myocardial infarction, and then 35% uh, were what they called monoschemic. So what they first did was look at all 686 patients, look at who, look at who got unloaded and who didn't get unloaded. And so they called this the unmatched uh, analysis because they just looked at all their patients. And you can see that in the blue line, they called ECMO and Impella, they called it ECMELA as opposed to VA ECMO alone, and they found that ECMELA did have um, a lower mortality rate. Uh, the, the significance was very borderline, it was 0.05, but, um, but the signal was there. And then they did a propensity score match where they looked at, you can see the, end, the sample size here is 255, they matched it as opposed to here where they uh, used the entire cohort. And when they did a propensity score matching, they did find that there was significantly reduced mortality in patients who got ECMELA as opposed to VA ECMO alone. And then in this paper, they started to look into whether there was a benefit to early versus delayed. They defined delayed as more than two hours post ECMO. And you can see that in patients who got early unloading, there was lower mortality and uh, compared to those that got VA ECMO alone. However, when they looked at all patients with delayed, um, uh, LV unloading, there was still, you know, a slight decrease in mortality, but this was not significant. You can see the P is 0.22. So over here, they're already trying to make an argument that you should do it early rather than later. And then they published another paper in 2023 that was a little bit more of an uh, elegant, and they, they had more data at this point. And basically, this is a, it, it sort of looks like a spline curve with uh, Cox proportional hazard modeling. And basically, what they found was that in early unloading, so basically, they uh, time zero is ECMO, and then they looked at whether you unloaded uh, with an impella earlier or, or later, and then they essentially filled in all the data and then, and then uh, created this hazard ratio figure. And they found that there's evidence to suggest that early unloading is better and late unloading is worse. And so that's kind of what this figure is supposed to demonstrate. And then the last data, uh, last uh, uh, original research that I'll present is um, from this Jack article published in 2022. And this uses the ELSO database, which is the world's largest um, uh, ECMO database. And uh, But one thing I'll say about this database is that the key limitation you'll have to understand is that 86.4% of these patients in the study had a balloon pump or Impala prior to VA ECMO. So the balloon pump or the Impella was not really used as an LV unloading strategy per se, but really um, it was used to support the heart and then patient failed the therapy and that's why they used VA ECMO. So VA ECMO in this case was used as therapy intensification. So while it's potentially still important to look at, you know, Jack published it, so I think we should look at it, but you know, it wasn't used directly the way that answers the question that I'm posing. So uh, they had three groups, essentially, uh, patients who did not get unloaded, which is this 9,335, and then the balloon pump and the Impella group right here. So first question they want to look at is unloading versus no unloading. So basically, there's multiple confounders, and so they use multivariable logistic regression and look at the odds ratios. And what they found was that in-hospital mortality was less 
in patients who did get mechanical unloading in VA ECMO. And then the next question that they wanted to ask was, well, is there a difference between balloon pump and, um, and percutaneous LVAD? And so what they found was that the um, in-hospital mortality trended to less with intra-aortic balloon pump, but it wasn't significant. You can see it, uh, it crosses one and the p-value is 0 0.06. However, you know, they did have less medical site bleeding, less medical bleeding, less cannula site bleeding, et cetera. So the hypothesis was that there's less injury, less uh, complications with intra-aortic balloon pump, which is driving that. However, again, I think that the data to answer this question is a little uh, spotty and I would not uh, use this. Uh, we're not, I would not take this as gospel. So um, the key clinical questions that I posed earlier, let's go back to them. So which patient population should we consider for LV unloading? So uh, based on my interpretation of the data, I would say that all patients with cardiogenic shock on VA ECMO. And then are there a key clinical or hemodynamic var variable to consider for LV unloading? And I think that if you have pulmonary edema, if you have aortic valve non-opening, and then you know, depending on how how much you believe the echo or the PAC data, you know, the wedge or the VTI, you can consider that too. But I definitely think that if you develop pulmonary edema or you're, you have aortic valve non-opening, that's really an emergency to go for LV unloading. And then when should we consider it? And there is some data now to suggest that early is likely better. However, uh, you know, we haven't tested this in a randomized clinical trial. And then should you use uh, Impella percutaneous LVAD versus balloon pump? And Honestly, I don't think that data convinces me too much. So how do we put it, start putting all this together? And so uh, Dr. Raleigh, who's a heart failure critical care uh, cardiologist at Vanderbilt, published this nice review in JCF. And basically, he posits that you should think about what the strategy of your VA ECMO is. And so, he, so what he put in the review is that if you're using VA ECMO as a bridge to recovery or decision, then you should do early LV unloading to allow for maximal recovery of the heart. Because, the, because if you unload the heart, it's going to help it recover better. It's going to support it better. And that's probably the most important thing for the patient's outcome. However, if you know for a fact that the patient needs a heart transplant or the patient needs a VAD, then he thinks that... that um, that unloading the left ventricle really is better with wait and see because anytime you unload mechanically, you need to put in another device or another large bore cannula, uh, usually arterial, and that is obviously not without its own complications. You know, it can impede patients' ability to walk, it can predispose them to bleeding complications, uh, thrombosis, stroke, all these things. And so, since you're since you're going to support the heart with a VAD or a heart transplant, anyways. It's probably more important just to wait and see, and you're not trying to recover the heart. You're just trying to bridge them to a destination therapy, which is heart transplant or VAD. The last thing that I'm going to uh, uh, bring up is to review that ECLS shock trial again that was published in October 2023. So again, the, the summary from that trial was that there's no benefit from VA ECMO and cardiogenic shock due to MI. But one thing that I do want uh, to pay attention is there was one um, one uh, row in, in, I think, table two that I thought was very interesting, where only 11 out of 191 patients were unloaded, which means it was just 5.8%. I think there's a lot of reasons why this trial wasn't uh, positive or didn't demonstrate any benefit of VA ECMO, but I do think that one question that we could ask is, would there have been more favorable results if more patients were unloaded, uh, when, if more patients had their LV unloaded? So, Kind of starting to wrap things up, I think that whenever we think about cannulating people for VA ECMO and thinking about who's going to benefit from VA ECMO, uh, we always like to focus on the reward, you know, like we like to think about you can provide them five to six liters per minute of cardiac output and you can give them lots of pulmonary support. However, with great reward comes also great risk and these are usually what contributes to patients mortality. That's like bleeding complications, acute limb ischemia, thrombosis or embolism leading to either you know, LV thrombus, uh, stroke, uh, and then again, limb ischemia. And then the one that we just talked about is increased LV afterload. So I think when there's great reward and great risk, in order to find efficacy in a therapy, you really have to focus on the patient selection. So I think that is what the focus probably will be on 
and future trials is trying to identify that patient that will really benefit. However, if, if um, another way to go about it instead of going with patient selection is what if you can improve, improve the technology or the strategies? For example, you know, for building complications, what if we could get away with lower ACT goals? Um, or what if we could find ways to reduce all these complications? And so another way to find efficacy in a therapy is if you can improve the therapy to make it great reward and low risk. And then at that point, patient selection becomes less important because pretty much all patients will benefit. Um, but that's just my two cents. So case conclusion, the patient underwent successful heart transplant on hospital day 33. There's no complications intra-op or hospital and the patient was discharged on hospital day 50. So here's my last slide. So use of VA ECMO and cardiogenic shock has dramatically increased over the last 20 years. During cardiogenic shock, VA ECMO increases LV afterload, resulting in higher EDP and lower stroke volumes. Complications from increased LV afterload are aortic valve non-opening, pulmonary edema, and impaired coronary perfusion. LV unloading reduces LV afterload and can minimize complications due to VA ECMO. And observational data suggests that early or proactive unloading is better than late. Uh, thank you guys for your time. Jeff, thanks. Uh, excellent talk, great review. Um, a very interesting topic, uh, you know, always when you don't have a lot of data, uh, but uh, always, a, you know, interesting topic, but a lot of good informed opinions there. So um, I guess, and you may have mentioned this, I'm sorry to take a couple, took a couple calls during your, during your talk. So acute coronary patients that end up on, on ECMO, do you feel like, is that someone that you would pretty have a, have a pretty low suspicion or you know, pretty low threshold for unloading sort of up, up front and improve perfusion or are those patients that, you know, are maybe less likely to do it because a lot of times they have maybe not as dilated a ventricle and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, a very good question. I think it. So, you know, I I think that um, I th I think that there is a benefit. Can you still see my slides by any chance? Yeah. Or no? No. Okay. Here, let me let me just pull it up real quick. So, I I do think that you know, all things being equal, like if you can, like in patients with uh, acute cardio, uh, like like AMICS, if you can unload the left ventricle, it's probably better. However. You know, you got to think about the complications, and you know, if a patient gets an axillary impella place, and then they, and then they develop a huge hematoma, or they develop like a huge um, like pneumothorax, or they develop a stroke, obviously you're not doing the patient any favors. And so, you know, we're not we're still not able to predict who's going to do well or who's not going to do well. And then it, it's really got to be a risk risk benefit analysis. But you know, it, it, if placing an impella were zero risk. I definitely think that an AMI cardiogenic shock, that that yes, early unloading is probably the right thing to do because um, you're reducing the myocardial oxygen consumption with LV unloading and you're um, re re reducing the LV EDP. And those things are known to be beneficial to the myocardium doing acute myocardial infarction uh, cardiogenic shock. There's actually a um, I don't want to I don't want to take up too much time, but there's actually a um, a trial going on called the Danger Trial, the Danish German AMICS trial, where um, it's not VA ECMO, but basically all patients with AMI complicated by cardiogenic shock, they're being randomized to impella no impella. So I think that is going to be really interesting to see what the results of that is. Thanks. All right, other questions from the group. Uh, Jeff Stan Sherman. Uh, I guess my question is, is there a time limit in terms of waiting that we try the patient on VO ECMO and Impel and, and all these things and uh, where, you know, you have decreasing benefits? Is there any indication about a time limit on some of these things? Because, yes, you'd like to wait a little while maybe for uh, postpartum cardiomyopathy to see if they improve on their own, et cetera. But uh, did, did they mention any of that in any of these studies? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, off, so it really depends on the strategy. So, and I'm guessing you're referring mainly to bridge to recovery or bridge to decision, not really bridge to LVAT or heart transplant. Is that, is that, is that, do I understand your question correctly? 
That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so there really hasn't been a study looking at the duration of efficacy of VA ECMO, but obviously we know that uh, there are other studies that show that, that obviously the duration of VA ECMO you lead to worse outcome, and it's probably just because non-recovery, our patients develop complications. But I would say that, you know, much like other therapies like mechanical ventilation or, you know, CRRT, that there really isn't a strict cutoff. And what you really got to do is just kind of, you know, like talk to the family. You got to look at the complications and just the overall trajectory. But um, there's no strict cutoff. And it's really more just a clinical situation. So I think along those lines are when, when you are moving towards the possibility of LVAD, um, when does the complication rate go up substantially? When, when do you sort of pull the trigger and say, um, okay, we're going to implant a VAD, uh, particularly in someone who's waiting for a heart, heart transplant, but where you may need that additional bridge? Sorry, was, uh, was that a question for me? Yeah, that, that, uh, whether that came up, I, um, I mean, I hear discussions in our transplant committee meetings that, you know, after patients have been on VA ECMO for a week, 10 days or something, is it time to go ahead and move towards uh, LVAD versus continuing to wait for that transplant? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, uh, I think that, um, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, exactly. I think, so you're, I think you're referring to the bridge to decision type thing, exactly. So when, when exactly like when you start to develop complications and i i think that um from, from my limited experience during a critical care fellowship working with uh, the surgeons is that they don't like to wait very long like they they i think oftentimes they can get impatient if they really feel that um and i think rightfully so because they they see this all the time where a patient was a heart transplant candidate now is not was a vat candidate and then developed some you know like intracerebral hemorrhage and now is not and so I think that oftentimes that they like to like they like to um, they, they like to try to make a decision early on and basically say, you know, if the patient doesn't get it by Monday, then let's do a VAD. And so I, I think that they like to try to catch them before the complications happen, because once the complications happen, I feel that the, the surgeons become very hesitant to operate on a patient, rightfully so, because they don't want to have that. Because you know, once you put a VAT or a heart transplant in, the the numbers are are very closely monitored. Did, did that answer your question, Dr. Smith? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think I think I think that's right. We we just recently had a patient who had had a MI um, later. I think may have developed a VSD. Uh, was on VA ECMO for probably approaching two weeks, but who got a transplant. Um, yesterday or the day before, and I think is, is doing okay. But but that was certainly a discussion of, you know, how much longer can he be supported with VA ECMO, so. Yeah. Yeah, there's really no, um, yeah, VA ECMO is interesting. There's really no um, limitation per se. You know, people have been supported on it for months. And and also, you know, there are also a lot of centers too that even even with femoral cannulation, they will ambulate as scary as that sounds. And I've seen a couple of videos of it. You can find it if you Google it. And um, and so, you know, sometimes people who have been super stable on VA ECMO, I've even seen nurses wheeling them out with a resident or APP to just get some vitamin D outside. And so, you know, some, sometimes when you're doing stably well on ECMO and you're in the right, you're the right, uh, the the perfect candidate, really. Uh, you can be on there for months, even though that's probably a little scary to think about. Jeff, this is Coach Roniazzi. I think a great presentation of a very complicated uh, topic. Um, and I think you mentioned this in your slides, patient selection. I found in clinical experience that the age of the patient uh, plays a significant role and uh, guidelines are there, but I think we have to clinically evaluate each patient independently and then decide, I mean, treating STEMI patients in the cath lab, that's always going through my mind, um, which patients may benefit. And I think there's a lot of clinical judgment that goes into that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, like, I think that we're still really, really trying to, to um, balance this. You know, I, I, I kind of equate, equate VA ECMO like high stakes gambling. 
you know, the minimums are really high to get to the table. And you really have to be very careful about who you you put on there because you're doing the family and the and the patient really no service if you're bridging them to nowhere. But, you know, you, the, also the, the hard thing is you have such little time to decide. And so it's, it's, it's very difficult. And again, it, in, until the therapy becomes more of a low risk and great reward, um, kind of the way, you know, like PCI has gotten to the point where, you know, the the, the, the acute thrombosis period, uh, acute, the, per, the, the risk of acute thrombosis is pretty low now with uh, all the medications and the strategies and the stents um, that, you know, it's become a little bit more like this. It's not zero risk, but it's lower risk. And right now, unfortunately, ECMO is still more like this where you have to be very careful about who you select. So I, I totally agree. And age is honestly probably one of the most, um, probably one, one of the best surrogates, as you said, just because, uh, you know, they're less likely to bleed, they're less likely to have comorbidities. Uh, Stan Sherman again, Jeff, I wasn't sure I heard this right, but is there a study going on of Impella alone versus Impella versus Ec Impella plus ECMO? No, so there's no study currently that I could find. I mean, there might be some small stuff out there, but I tried, uh, I, I tried looking around to see if there was a randomized clinical trial for LV unloading, and there is not. The closest things I could find were this. So basically, um, uh, and, and this one could answer the question if the numbers are high enough and the, the investigators want to do a subgroup analysis, because these are all patients with acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. You do not have to be on ECMO. But inevitably, I'm sure some of them will end up on ECMO. And the intervention is basically if you come in with AMI complicated by cardiogenic shock, you get randomized to unloading or no unloading with Impella. And then I'm sure some will get ECMO. And if you do the subgroup analysis on the BA ECMO patients, then it could answer the question that you just posed. But the hemodynamics that make you have ECMO if you've had an Impella uh, is, is that uh, mainly the LVEDP or what which which hemodynamics is it that, that that make you really push towards ECMO? So um I, I think I think everyone's gonna have their own opinion and um and and kind of kind of a practice pattern, but I, I do think that um probably your 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 cardiac index and you know if you're starting to see end organ injury, if you're starting to see you know urine output drop off AKI your AST, ALT starting to elevate, your T-billy is not really, um, you know, your T-billy is not coming down too well. And so I think that if you're not getting the perfusion that you think you need, then I think people will oftentimes go to uh, VA ECMO. I'm not, does that answer your question by any chance? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking clinically, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a lot more to do than, than the Impella is. Correct, and, correct. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I just wanted to make sure we had the right parameters to say we're going to push towards the ECMO. And like you say, knowing that it's a bridge to something. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, good talk. Enjoy it. Thanks. Stan, also, I mean, and Jeff, you can correct me. There's a lot of still debate outside the United States, even between Impella and intraortic balloon pump. So there's not much consensus outside uh, when I've interacted with our colleagues um, outside the US, they just think that we tend to overuse uh, Impella and, as compared to the intraortic balloon pump. So that question is also still up there. I mean, though there have been some papers looking at it and in favor of Impella, but it's yeah, not resolved also. So that Dr. Niazi is exactly right. So the Europeans, I believe ESC, um, uh, the the balloon pump recommendation is very weak. I, I I think it might even be level like like three or two B or three. I think, and I think in AHA ACC guideline it's still like a two A, and so um and I think that's mainly uh, there's a guy there in Germany named Holger Thiele, Dr. Thiele, and he really doesn't believe in balloon pumps, and so I think he's a big driving force of why balloon pumps is not supported uh, in Europe as much. Okay, well, um, for what it's worth, I'm on the hospital service on Hearst right now, and we have a lady who I think was a good, um, seemed to be a good ECMO save. She had 
uh, myocarditis, presumably from influenza. Uh, got, you know, young woman uh, got extremely sick, uh, ventricular arrhythmias and cardiogenic shock and multi-organ failure and is sort of still recovering, uh, but but almost certainly seems like may not have survived uh, if she hadn't been transferred in and put on ECMO here. So um, yeah. anyway. Yeah, that, I, and, and I think that's like, you know, because, um, uh, you know, I'm not trying to, um, I, I have no financial interest in this, but I, I'm just saying that like, you know, I think a lot of people see this trial and they're like, oh, there's no, or there's not a great role for VA ECMO. But I think that, you know, intuitively we see results of it and we know it works in some patients. It's just really trying to find that patient population to find out who's going to benefit from it and who's not going to benefit from it and suffer more complications from it. And sometimes you can't even predict that things just happen. So, you know, I, I think the question is not does, it's not that does VA ECMO work? We know it works. I mean, it generates five to six liters of cardiac output if you need it, but it's who, who is the right patient for VA ECMO? And is there any way we can reduce the complications from VA ECMO? I think those are the real questions we should be asking. Yeah, and Robbie, just a, a comment about that. You know, um, we have seen a number of patients with fulminant myocarditis who have been supported with VA ECMO and then have gone on to have complete recovery. So one of the interesting things about fulminant myocarditis is that if you can get through um get through it um, and survive it, that you're much more likely to have total recovery as is compared to someone who may have more of a chronic myocarditis type type picture. Um, and so it's important when you have somebody in that situation to get them to the right center where they can be taken care of properly. Hi, right. it's, oh. Oh, it's Christina Thaler. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, the other thing I think there's also, at least for the trials that have been done, not all the centers had a huge amount of experience and training at some of those centers, there was definitely a learning curve for some of it where some of the initial patients didn't do as well as perhaps a year into it. Um, and so I also think that is complicating some of our data for studying it also. So um, but then when you have the negative trials, it's harder to get the next set of trials. Yeah, no, I think that's entirely right. And so there's been, so uh, I think most people on this call probably know that, know that VA ECMO is very lucrative. So there's a lot of, you know, centers that are trying to pop up and, and do VA ECMO. And so there's also been this pushback to say that VA ECMO, much like trauma centers and much like, you know, STEMI centers, are there, it should be regionalized and it should be high volume centers. So I think I think France has a good model of that where I think there's only like I want to say like three or four hospitals that really do a large volume of ECMO and it's uh, and, and those those hospitals have volumes of like three to four hundred maybe five hundred a year of, of VA ECMO cases. All right well um, thanks again to Jeff uh, fantastic talk and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and we will see everybody next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.